Well, I'd like to first thank uh, Koku and Mike and Lars for organizing this meeting to celebrate Salam's 90th birthday and for inviting me to give a talk here. <coughs> well, uh, what I intend to do within the limited time is to first say a few words about Salam, much has been said, and also about how my collaboration started with Salam, leading some, some of the ideas, mainly to reflect his personality in science and also as a human being. I would then turn into some aspects of the scientific part of the talk where I will discuss some consequences that uh, very much in its core has the kind of symmetry that uh, Salam and I proposed, uh, but in, in its modern version. Uh, let's see. Yes. Well, to me, Salam was a truly rare individual, a phenomenon, a great scientist and a humanitarian, full of dreams. Uh, let's see, is there a pointer? full of dreams and great passion, not just in physics, but equally so in spreading science to the third world. Deservedly, he is best known for his pioneering works on electroweak unification, a major achievement of the 20th century, for which he received the Nobel Prize, shared the Nobel Prize with Sheldon Glashow and Steven Weinberg. And of course, he had many major contributions. The idea of uh, the removing the overlapping divergences, suggesting the two component theory of the neutrino uh, in the late 50s. Independently, this was also suggested by Li and Yang and by Landau. Salam was very proud of this idea uh, to guarantee that neutrinos are massless. Uh, as you will see, he will be led to change his fondness for two-component theory uh, in collaboration with me. Now then, of course, a very important contribution, super space, super field formalism with strategy. There are many more. But in addition to these contributions to physics, Salam will certainly be remembered for his unique and invaluable contributions to the propagation of science in the third world. His lifelong efforts in this direction has led to creation of many outstanding international centers and foundations. The prime example is the Abdus Salam International Center for Theoretical Physics, which is indeed a great asset to the world as a whole, and especially, of course, to the third world. I don't know the number, but it's a very, very large number of physicists coming from the third world, which Fernando Vedo may be able to provide, who really have benefited by coming to the center. And it's an inspiration for, the, for, for all of us. Now, Salam dreamt of creating 20 international centers around the world and a world university. He was coming and spending some time with me at Maryland and also to do physics. But during those, the, the, that time, he also took the opportunity to visit the World Bank people quite uh, seriously and uh, was keeping me informed of the progress. There was promise, but unfortunately he fell ill and could not really realize this. He was also very keen to establish a world university. And this dream remains to be fulfilled. But now, it is most encouraging that ICTP centers are coming up, thanks to Fernando Covedo and others, 
the local people and the governments. Uh, we learn of such center in Brazil, China, Mexico, and Uganda, and hopefully Salam's dream will be fulfilled through these efforts. Salam's singular devotion to science and its propagation, I'm suffering from some sore throat, so thanks for bringing. Uh, his singular devotion to science and its propagation, and of course his success in this regard, came at great personal sacrifice. Very briefly, I should say that, as you know, he was living mostly by himself in the villa next to ICTP. Uh, and he was visiting his family members in England, uh, maybe for a few days, two, three days, every once, two weeks or, or so, or three weeks. But this meant great personal sacrifice. Uh, he would bring his food cooked by his wife for those two week gap. Uh, then he will sometimes invite me and ask his wife to give a little more so that I can share it with Yogesh. And uh, that was delicious cooking. But that's how he managed. He was uh, coming 8 o'clock in the morning and going back to the villa at 6 o'clock uh, every day, Saturday, Sunday, notwithstanding. Uh, you know that Triaste is surrounded by beautiful uh, sea beaches and mountains, but Salam never saw any of them, not even a single one. And uh, for him, work was vacation. And uh, in fact, that affected me a little bit. When we started collaborating uh, in the early years, uh, Salam would say, uh, do you think you could uh, stay over during the weekend? And I would think a little bit. I would say, see, I went to Triaste with my wife and the children. I said that uh, if I do, then I may not be able to come back in the next year um, because the family would like to visit some of the places during the weekends. And I have to also admit, I myself wanted to because I thought that always gives, that was good for me to think that the mountains and the seashore are always sources of, source of great inspiration. But Salam understood that and that's all I'm trying to say is that I have no words to express adequately the spirit with which he sacrificed all his personal comforts and benefits and relationship with the, with the family for the sake of science and for the sake of the center and for the sake of the cause that he really believed in. Now I'd like to turn into uh, the uh, into how my collaboration started with Salam in the year 1972. That was May of 1972. But perhaps before saying it, uh, I would just remind which, what you have been hearing that this at that time the standard model was not tested at all, right? Electroweak theory had not been tested and QCD or SU3 color was still in S72, was not really part of the standard model. But now, that's why I'm saying, um, let me tell about now first. We know the standard model is in excellent agreement with experiments, both in the QCD and in the electroweak sectors. It's a great triumph of the gauge principle, the Higgs, Engler, Braut, Guralnik, Hagen, Kibble mechanism, in short, the Higgs mechanism, renormalizability as a principle, and asymptotic freedom of non-abelian gauge theories is a, is, a, is a very important part in the whole picture. But in spite of this success, there exists clear evidence for physics beyond the standard model now. Neutrino masses, barring unnatural parameters, 
uh, in Ikawa coupling such as of order 10 to the power minus 12. And the Higgs mass fine tuning, the question of dark matter, need for inflation to understand many cosmological puzzles, and the baryon axis, which is one part in 10 billion. All, all the, these five do need physics beyond the standard model. It so happens that they also go well with the idea of supersymmetry and grand unification. Now, there is the dark energy problem, could be the cosmological constant problem, and that to me is, is a mystery at the moment, uh, notwithstanding the landscape view. So this is now, but going back to summer of 72, May 1972, I had just returned, the, the, spent this uh, previous six months in Delhi University as a, um, in my sabbatical. I was actually not aware of the great uh, excitement that was taking place after Gerard proved the renormalizability of the electroweak theory. There was a lot of excitement during those six months. Uh, and I was not uh, at all familiar with any of them. So when I arrived, I started learning them. In, uh, and by the way, at that time, even neutral current processes were not discovered. And there was some indication that neutral currents may even be absent. In fact, uh, Georgia and Glashow and many others wrote papers getting rid of the neutral currents. Now, to me, when I learned this, in a way, it was good that I hadn't kept up. When I learned this, it appeared that the heart of the matter lay somewhere else, not in finding variants of the electroweak theory, but in removing the arbitrariness of the electroweak theory, first in its gaze sector. The, I would elaborate on this question, and I should remind you that in May 1972, the, there was no clear idea of the nature of fundamental strong interactions. There was no consensus about need for SU3 color degree of freedom, even as a global symmetry. This was, however, proposed in 65 with an explicit degree of freedom by Han and Nambu, and by implicitly by Weinberg a year before through parastatistics. But there was no clear co consensus, and asymptotic freedom had not yet been discovered. So in this context, a SU3 color gaze symmetry was introduced as the fundamental and only source of strong interactions during the year 72-73 for two independent reasons. In 72, it was the attempt at higher unification, unifying weak electromagnetic and strong interactions and quarks and leptons. And that su suggested, those kind of attempts suggested that the low energy symmetry of the higher symmetry must be SU2 color cross U1 cross SU3 color. Just about a year later, Asymptotic freedom was discovered, as David mentioned, and uh, in relationship also to an explanation of the uh, slack or Yurkin scaling, that provided a compelling motivation for SU3 color. So it worked very well. And so uh, before doing the I, I when I realized that I'm not happy with the way this standard model is and not even having this uh, the strong interactions I mentioned to Salam one day during the tea within about a couple of weeks after my arrival there that uh, you know even if electroweak theory or su2 cross u1 theory turns out to be correct it can't be a fundamental theory. There has to be some underlying structure out of which uh, this emerges. 
and the arbitrariness of the electroweak sector must be removed by this higher symmetry, especially in the gauge sector. And uh, so he asked, what do you have in mind? I said, uh, it means that we must somehow understand why the cores and leptons coexist, why the three forces coexist, and why electric charge is quantized, and especially why electron and proton charge are exactly equal and opposite, and so on. Now, this in other in turn will mean, because if electron and proton charge ratio has to be understood, quarks and leptons must be unified as members of one multiplet, and the three forces have to be unified as, as, as part of one gauge force. He, he said, rather than exp expressing any resistance, uh, which some others did actually. Uh, he said that sounds like a great idea and then started our collaboration. So we looked at this together. Some of the motivations we had were, for example, as I said, removing the arbitrariness in choice of, it was purely aesthetic at that time, uh, choice of standard model quantum numbers, uh, quantization of electric charge, electron proton charge ratio, coexistence of quarks and leptons, and coexistence of the three forces. So the main idea was to remove, was to address these issues, and it became clear that one must unify quarks and leptons as one kind of matter with symmetry group, some symmetry group, bigger symmetry group G, and unify the three forces as aspects of one force by gauging the symmetry G. Now, therefore, the distinctions between quarks and leptons and between the three forces are low energy phenomena which should disappear at predictably high energies. This idea has many testable predictions, and that's uh, uh, what makes it interesting. <coughs> Although it, uh, the unification takes place at very high energies, there are many predictions for at low energies. This idea in the, uh, we, we uh, the way we proposed was minimally you sh one should ex uh, um, extend you, you no notice the standard model With respect to the standard model, we have, uh, for example, members of one family are uh, in five disconnected multiplets, sort of arbitrarily put in, and the left and right are treated very differently, and the hypercharge is just put in so that the electric charge will work out right, hypercharge given by the superscripts, but there is no compelling reason for choice of this uh, hypercharge quantum number or the other quantum numbers and for quantization of electric charge and for the quantities that I just mentioned, the electron proton charge ratio and the three forces. So what we found was that to answer this question just in one stroke, one must minimally extend this symmetry to the symmetry I have written here. SU2 left, cross SU2 right, cross SU4 color, with a left-right discrete symmetry, impose them on them, uh, impose on the structure because that is natural. Once it is SU2 right. Well, let me so just say one thing: SU4 color is now acting on the horizontally with, in, uh, with three core colors, and the fourth one being the lepton color. So the idea was to simply remove the bar here. There used to be a bar in the standard model. Remove it and extend it to include all four colors. In the same way with the down sector, uh, but that has consequences. The first thing one realized is that if one takes SU4 color and impose quantization of electric charge, then it automatically means that the flavor sector should be gauged <laughs> as SU2 right together with SU2 left, which acts vertically on the left and right components. So that 
we have altogether 16 objects with uh, the left components transforming like 2, 1, 4 and the left right conjugate of this <coughs> is the right components transforming as 1, 2, 4. All 16 are in one left right self conjugate multiplet, not in five scattered multiplets. And what is more, all the quantum numbers including hypercharge are completely fixed. And electromagnetic charge is quantized because such a group and you can immediately see that the electron proton charge ratio will be exactly minus 1 in this way. Quantization of electric charge does not guarantee electron proton charge ratio being minus 1. One can find exceptions to that. But having the SU4 color together with it does guarantee it. And the mo one most interesting thing was, well, interesting not at that time, according to most people, was that one was forced to introduce the right-handed neutrino as a compelling feature because we have the right-handed up core, its fourth color partner must be a right-handed neutrino. And that meant neutrinos should be massive. And now, within a few years, it was realized that it is actually small in a natural way because the right-handed neutrino would acquire, being a singlet of the standard model, would acquire, uh, gen gen generically can and, and will acquire a heavy Majorana mass using the same kind of Higgs that we had introduced, nothing new in the same structure. And the fact that B minus L is a generator is crucial because if you didn't have it, you couldn't protect the mass of the right-handed neutrino up to the unification scale of 10 to the power 16 GeV or so. And therefore, it could be even Planck scale, the right-handed neutrino being a singlet of the standard model, or it could be even the TV scale. So that's a 16 orders of magnitude uncertainty, which goes away the moment you have B minus L as a generator and part of a unified theory. Now, it's clear that all these advantages are retained if you extend the symmetry to a simple group like SO10. SO10 has the advantage that it also requires the same number of, the, it does not need any extra fermions, the 16 fermions, but except you must now take the charge conjugate of the right-handed uh, objects and it will, uh, it will retain all the advantages of SU2, SU2, SU4 color in addition guarantee unification of the coupling. There are some advantages of having 2 to 4 from a string theory in four dimension. I won't uh, have time to discuss this. And there are some advantages of being SO10. So both have some re advantage relative to the other. Then you could also, also consider extending farther, but here you will need additional fermions. Now, about a year after this suggestion, there was, of course, the interesting suggestion of SU5, which was uh, the minimal grand unification symmetry the, uh, with members of the multiplet in two multiplets, 5 bar plus 10. But there is no compelling reason for right-handed neutrino, and there is no B minus L. So even if you introduce the right-handed neutrino, its major inner mass is completely arbitrary from the Planck scale up to the electro, uh, electroweak scale. So that does not, of course, help. And the same thing, therefore, does not help for baryogenesis via leptogenesis. So this is the general picture that evolved in the summer of 72. And uh, it was uh, reported, uh, actually, in the Batavia conference, uh, thanks to your Ken. Uh, I wrote a handwritten manuscript, uh, draft which Salam hadn't seen. And uh, he somehow appreciated the idea. His talk was the next day. And he, he has, of course, he des described it and has put it in the proceedings. So that is the beginning of this work. And uh, at this stage, let me just say that a uh, couple of things. Again, coming back to Salam, uh, some personal things. That is, uh, following this, there was the uh, two important things. One was 
the suggestion of SU5, as I have listed here. And the other was in 74, this was after the discovery of asymptotic trium, that is Georgi, Queen, and Weinberg uh, did the calculation of the running of the couplings. And uh, at that time, of course, the values of alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3 were not measured as accurately, but they could show that how the three couplings could meet with a prediction for sine square theta w. That was updated by bringing in supersymmetry at a TV, a TV scale or 100 GV scale, which was independently motivated. Supersymmetry at the TV scale is independently motivated, being the most elegant way to understand the Higgs mass by and avoiding unnatural fine tuning. So one in the same scale for the supersymmetric particles extended the unification and led to the correct prediction for sine square theta w. And this was this all this I will say in a moment fell together. So that, that was an important thing. And we also realized in 72 that in this kind of approach with unification of course in electron, proton must decay. And that was a prediction, and that remains to be uh, verified. Georgia and Glashow also got similar things. And then experimentalists were, took it seriously and tried testing. They have, in the meantime, found neutrino oscillation, which is a crucial feature of the kind of symmetry we proposed based on SU4 color. But they are yet to find proton decay. And today, with the limited time, I will say that we have, why we have good reasons to think that the next generation detectors ought to detect proton decay, should find proton decay. Now, uh, with all this, as ideas were evolving, Salam and I had many exchanges, many discussions in person and through letters, sometimes very heated ones. And, uh, uh, even the secretary sometimes commented, how can you do this uh, kind of discussion with Salam? I said, well, this is the way things are. Uh, so anyway, they will be shouting at each other sometimes. And uh, the good thing is that uh, Salam never took it ill. And then, uh, for example, he will sometimes get very excited about some idea and then tell me, uh, that what do you think of this? So, uh, if I for some reason didn't like it, and suppose I expressed frankly that no, I don't like it for such and such reason, he would then reply back to me saying, My dear sir, what do you want? Blood? And uh, so I smiled, holding him with great respect, and I will say, No, Professor Salam, I want something better. Well, whether I was right or wrong, uh, as I said, he never took it ill, and that's what kept our collaboration and friendship strong all the way for more than two decades. And uh, okay, let me go quickly on this. One quick remark, there are many advantages of this uh, SU2, SU2, SU4 color as an effective symmetry beyond the standard model. But at the time it was proposed, we, when I was giving seminars, everybody was pointing at, why do you need this right-handed neutrino? It's an ugly feature because uh, neutrinos are massless anyway. And in the meantime, SU5 had come into existence, which didn't need the right-handed neutrino, and therefore neutrinos were massless. So I was always uh, on the defensive saying, however, I feel that this is a much prettier theory, and therefore it ought to be right, and neutrinos will be massive, and a mechanism will be found that will explain why it is so light. And at, as you know, that was found within four years uh, by Minkowski and then by a group, group of authors two years later. So that everything fell into place, and uh, neutrino being massive, was very much in the picture from the beginning. It was a burden at that time, but now it is an asset. And B minus as a generator 
is again an important feature and uh, right handed neutrino is playing the major role in first of all explaining why the left handed neutrino is so light and at the same time it was realized as Kaiser Shafi was commenting that uh, the right handed super heavy right handed neutrino since it is a Majorana mass it uh, uh, that is Fukujita and Nagida uh, they realized uh, in mid 80s following the uh, re uh, result of uh, Kuzmin, Rubakov and Shaposnikov on the electro expelleron effect that uh, really the decay of the right handed neutrino the super heavy right handed neutrino in the early universe uh, for after inflation uh, would then naturally generate the uh, a lepton excess which is leptogenesis and that would be converted by the electro expelleron effect to give you baryon excess that is observed today and makes you and me. This idea has been now put in quantitatively it is uh, as uh, David was commenting it you may accept it, but I feel this is the most promising idea we now have for understanding baryon excess and uh, it does work together with an understanding of fermion masses and mixings in the context of SO10 or SU2, SU2, SU4 color models it does give you roughly the answer which is without any in a very natural way one part in about 10 billion. So in this sense the right handed neutrino which was an ugly duckling at the time it was proposed has transformed itself into a beautiful swan and we think that is doing a lot of good things. Uh, these are some of the evidence in favor of grand unification now as we know which have many of them have come uh, after the idea was proposed the first three were the original motivations, but then the, 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 the meeting of the three couplings which was realized after the lep experiment was quite a strong motivation or evidence in favor of grand unification and I will show the curve for a mo in a moment maybe I should show it now this is the curve that you are all familiar with uh, the, with, the, with the lep measurements the three couplings together with the assumption of supersymmetry at low scale the three couplings really meet and you see one comment I must make, make is that uh, you notice the prediction of sin square theta w is in very good agreement with the experiment. Now this feature will not work if many people try to break SU2, SU2, SU4 color or the SO10 in multiple steps to the standard model which in principle uh, is possible and they consider it, but that will lose the successful prediction of sin square theta w. So the single step breaking between the gut scale and into the electroic uh, scale that uh, is crucial to go to have a predictive uh, number for the weak angle and that seems to work. So that is many things the neutrino mass scale which is what I will uh, I will go back now to the previous transparency the neutrino oscillation uh, which was uh, actually found in 1998 uh, at Super Kemio Kande with atmospheric neutrino oscillation with a mass scale of 1 20th of an electron volt this number quantitatively actually emerges if you combine the unification scale of 2 10 to the power 16 GeV as you saw from the previous curve to predict the uh, Majorana mass of the right handed neutrino and then the SU4 color you can use to predict quite confidently the Dirac mass of the neutral the third family because it will be equal to the top mass at the unification scale which we know experimentally and that by theoretical extrapolation it is of the order of 100 GV if you put the two together with, within the CISO mechanism you get 120 about 120th of an electron volt within factors of 2 or 3. So that number 
is a very crucial evidence in favor of this route of unification. And uh, uh, as I said, I have also uh, there are other things like this smallness of VCB and simultaneously the maximality or near maximality of the atmospheric neutrino oscillation angle. That comes out essentially as a group theory, theoretic uh, uh, feature. Uh, so, uh, and similarly, the baryon excess by leptogenesis. And you see these are nine features, all successful, and that's non trivial. So, one may consider the further prediction of this uh, somewhat to take it seriously and try to test the further predictions. I will skip some of this. So we, we already saw that meeting of the three couplings is verified. So I put a check mark there. These are some of the striking consequences of these ideas. The neutrino mass with the magnitude that we have seen is also seen, verified. And the proton decay is a crucial hallmark prediction of the idea of grand unification. And uh, what fi one finds, as is know, known to most people working in the field, is that there are two types of decays, one by the mediated by the leptochore gauge bosons, and the other by the color triplet hexenos, giving E plus pi zero and nu bar k plus mode. What I would like to hope to say in briefly at least, is that we actually end up in recent work setting upper limits for these decay modes, which are well within an or less than an order of magnitude higher than the current super k limits. So they are completely testable and can be excluded. Hopefully they will be observed and proton decay will be discovered. I will skip this. This is more technical. This is the breaking of SO10. We, we follow, follow with the, starting with the work with Frank Wilczek and Babu, we follow the breaking pattern of the left side, which has the low dimensional multiplets. The adjoint of SO10 and 16, 16 bar of SO10 and 10 of SO10, as opposed to the large dimensional multiplets, which majority of the people consider. But the trouble with this is that the gut scale threshold correction becomes too large of the order of 30 to 40 percent from the sub multiplets when they are broken to the standard model. So we confine to this because it is more predictive as far as gut threshold corrections. That is what leads to the upper limit as well as the successful uh, predictive framework for fermion masses mixing, neutrino oscillation, CP violation and with predictions for flavor violating decay, I won't talk about any of these things. But it is all within the one same framework. Okay, can I take about another part? Yeah, I'll try. Okay, so let me, since the chairman has said, well, this is, this is what I was alluding to, that if you put together the ideas of a chiffon color and the unification scale 10 to the power 16 GV, you get the automatically the light neutrino mass in this range, which is, a, which is what is observed in the atmospheric neutrino oscillation. Now, this is very rough indication of how one calculates the lepton asymmetry. I will skip that. But maybe, this may be interesting that uh, uh, the, until 1998, the discovery of atmospheric neutrino oscillations at Super Kamiokande, I would say most physicists, most distinguished physicists, uh, really believe that neutrinos are truly massless. And uh, one reflection of this is the extreme one which is, uh, I'm quoting from C.N. Young. Uh, he gave this talk in 2002, which was after the atmospheric neutrino oscillation and the snow discovery of solar neutrino oscillation 
confirming Bacall's and the calculation in Ray Davis's uh, observations. In, so in 2002, he says that personally I tend to disbelieve unnecessary subtleties. That is perhaps why Dyson called me conservative. I didn't believe in neutrino oscillations even after Davis's painstaking work and Bacall's careful analysis. The oscillations were, I believed, uncalled for. Now, after the beautiful experiments, which you shall hear about in the next few days, I have to surrender and accept neutrino oscillations as reality, but still as unnecessary subtleties. Well, after his talk, outside of the talk, I went and talked to him, and uh, this is the remark I made to him. Uh, relative, relative to Young's remark, it seems appropriate to mention that neutrino oscillations and thus neutrino masses now appear to be a very necessary subtlety of nature in the sense that the tiny neutrino masses seems to be the nature's way to provide a clue to physics at the unification scale with the right handed neutrino being so super heavy that is near the gut scale so that the tininess of observed neutrino is a reflection of physics at the gut scale. And also, this right, right, the, the, the same understanding of the tiny neutrino masses seem to be at the root of the origin of matter, antimatter asymmetry, and thus at the root of our origin. Salam, uh, Young appreciated this, and uh, I gave him some reference also. He was not familiar. May I, I may mention in this regard also, it may be interesting, that when we started working, Salam and I, and when he saw that SU4 color means there is a right handed neutrino needed, uh, he said he doesn't like it. I said, uh, why? Because he said that you, uh, you know, I am the father of the two component theory of the neutrino, and you want to take my fatherhood away? So I said, no, Professor Salam. I feel that uh, this, would be, this is a much prettier idea. Uh, the, that two component theory of the neutrino was good at that time, but I think this is a much prettier idea, and neutrino will be found to be massive. In a short while, he also uh, realized the same way, and then we wrote our paper together. But that was the resistance towards, so I will we have to go more, rather quickly toward the end. These were the mechanisms for proton decay, which are known to be standard. I won't explain them because of shortage of time. But I will mention one thing. How is it that we are getting upper limits on uh, a, a proton lifetime? Well, the proton lifetime for the dimension 6, e plus pi 0, is governed by the mass of x. But this is proportional to x to the power fourth, the decay, um, the, the, the lifetime is proportional to x to the power four. So people just put in the unification scale, but it doesn't have to be the unification scale. It can change by factors of two or three that will change the lifetime by a factor of a hundred. So how to get, uh, get rid of this uncertainty? Now likewise, in the uh, in, the, in the dimension 5 operator, there is the color triplet hexino mass that goes in, but in SO10, it is actually an effective mass, which I won't explain, instead of the physical mass of the color triplet neutrino. But that effective mass, how to set a scale for this? And how to set a scale for Mx? At least an upper limit on these quantities, such that you will get upper limits on the proton lifetime for both modes. Well, very briefly, we do this in this work with, uh, this is something about the string theory uh, solutions with two to four, which are very interesting, but I won't discuss. We do this upper limit thing with the work with Babu and uh, Jurate Vatkilese, uh, more recent all work also. And basically, what we do is we, by including, because by including the gut scale threshold corrections, which involve
which involve the the masses of the x and that effective mass scale this they appear here and because we are using the low dimensional Higgs multiplies namely these we find ultimately by using there are three equations here we can eliminate and we find that really there is a prediction on upper limits or, or relation between m effective and m x which is what is given here that m effective ordinarily is not related to m x, but they become related inversely and having an inverse relation to mean if you give me the lower limit experimental lower limit on e plus by 0 that will trans, uh, translate into an experimental into a theoretical upper limit on m effective and vice versa. So, we will get a upper limit on m effective and an upper limit on m x that will give me upper limit on both lifetimes. So, this is what we do, but this is true for a given spectrum of Suji and we took considered a number of them consistent with reasonable naturalness with the, the stops being the lightest and this is the unification curve we get and this is the upper limit that we get. So, this is the upper limit for E plus by 0 and nu bar k plus you see the O experimentally this lower limit is about uh, 1.6 10 to the power 34 years. So, this is within a factor of 7 to 8 and this one experimentally is about 6.6 .6, 10 to the power 34. 33 years. So, this is also within a factor of 10. So, within factors of 5 to 10 above super kilometers. So, thus they are within striking distance and the prospects for uh, discovery of proton decay is should be high in this uh, kind of underground detectors being considered. The water Cherenkov detector uh, hyperchemio Kande and the liquid argon at Dune. So, both uh, so that takes me to the summary which is no this is the summary also. So, this the summary is simply showing you that there are many facts meeting of the couplings family quantum numbers quantization of electric charge and BCB leptogenesis all of them hang together within one picture and the missing piece is proton decay and supersymmetry. Thank you. Well, I'm proud to be an experimentalist and not getting involved in all these ideas. I still think about proton decay. I still be around, we are doing physics, when everybody told us that 10 to the 30 years was the right place where to look for proton decay. And now we are a few times 10 to 34. And uh, you said here there are new generation of experiments, certainly so. The question is, at which value of the uh, proton decay lifetime, you would say there is a strong disagreement between what you said to us today and reality. I mean, you say soon we are going to find it. How soon? And what is the value? No, the, the, this is something which you, as an experimentalist, we would like to know. If you say we have a huge theoretical framework which is supposed to do a proton decay, and you say proton decay is next door, the question for me is very simple. At which value of proton decay you would say there is a substantial disagreement between your predictions and the experiment? I think the second point question comes in, excuse me, I'd like to finish, about supersymmetry, which you also mentioned there. Why is supersymmetry associated with LHC? Maybe supersymmetry is occurring at much higher masses. Maybe supersymmetry occurs just at the Planck mass. I don't know. But why do you say LHC is a, is a key to supersymmetry? That seems to me also something which I don't understand. So I would like to know more precisely what are the value of proton decay below which, above which this, all this description will be uh, in difficulty. And the second thing I'd like to know why the supersymmetry has to be LHC connected. Oh, 
uh, well, actually, the second question is very relevant. Answer to the second question. The supersymmetry is very relevant to the picture for two reasons. One, even without grand unification, uh, remo uh, removing the fine tuning of in the Higgs mass, we do need supersymmetry at a low scale. And that's what I'm characterizing, which I did not explain pro uh, properly, that if you say that the fine tuning in the way one defines is not more than one part in 300 or so, then you have quite a nice uh, picture which is consistent with LAC1, namely the stops being light and uh, there are uh, constraints on uh, hexino mass. They are all perfectly consistent with the first two families being heavy. So you do have to pay, take that into account, but, and that's you also need it for the meeting of the three couplings. So the picture hangs together when you say that all of these are, that, that actually supersymmetry will be found. Now, even without supersymmetry, proton will decay in the context of non-supersymmetry S or 10. But then the uncertainty becomes higher. So whatever I've told you is within a well-motivated framework that, that is needed by many theorists may also share with me that supersymmetry is needed to be discovered at LAC2 and the certain spectrum of that type is constrained by naturalness. And that actually restricts the lifetime of proton in the framework I gave you because of the relationship. That relationship is independent of where supersymmetry is, that inverse relationship. But supersymmetry better be found for me to give you a definite number. So I have done in a fair way, whatever is there, then you find that really it ought to be discovered within factors of five or even certainly less than 10 of the current super K limits. And that will be reachable at hyper K and D. That's the best answer I can give you. Uh, I just want to uh, answer Carlo's points. Number one, uh, there are, as Dragi said, very good reasons to speculate that supersymmetry should appear in the LHC domain. Unification, hierarchy, and dark matter in addition. Uh, those are speculations based on experimental issues, theoretical issues, and they could be wrong. Speculations, of course, that's the role of theorists. But I would like to defend theory compared to your first remark that you're glad you're an experimentalist. Recalling Shelley, Shelley Glasso's curse. In some conference, Carlo was also putting down theorists, and Shelley said that he will curse him, that he, this was maybe 35 years ago, that Carlo, you will spend your life testing and verifying and confirming the standard model. And I have a feeling that his curse has come true. <laughs> That's a very good one. <laughs>